Okay. Well, welcome here. I said I would try and talk a little bit about the history of physics. Um, that's particularly pertinent to me right now because uh, for the last several months I've been very busily uh, working on physics and actually have some super exciting things that I figured out that uh, I'm hoping to talk about early next week. So this consider this a, a precursor of some of the things that I want to talk about next week about sort of progress in understanding fundamental physics. What I wanted to do here today was to discuss a bit some of the, um, some of the history of, uh, of physics as a field and how we've kind of got to where we are now. So um, let's start at the beginning. The question is, how does the world come to be the way it is? And in every culture, there have been creation myths. You know, some of the more extreme ones, you know, the world is made on the back of a turtle and it's turtles all the way down and so on. But there are, there's always a creation myth. And when it was written, it was written in the terms of explanations which were available at the time. And some of these creation myths seem to us these days mere analogies, allegories, etc. cetera. Um, actually, they often have quite interesting things to say um, if one sort of is prepared to translate them back into the sort of explanatory framework of the time. But I, I suppose that, you know, if we look at ancient civilizations, the ones about which we probably Clay tablets survive, and like I even let's see if I actually can pull it out. There we go. Yeah, sample clay tablet. There we go. That's a that's a little Babylonian tablet. Not a very exciting one. It's uh, this one I happen to have. It's a, um, uh, it's a it's a barley contract um, about somebody delivering selling barley, delivering it in a different month, and so on. But uh, this thing is uh, about oh, three four thousand years old. And what's, uh, what's neat about Babylonian things is that they've survived. And, you know, other civilizations that wrote on other media didn't survive. So what do we know about what the Babylonians did in terms of physics? They had astrologers uh, who would uh, try and predict things. They would try and predict, uh, you know, where planets would be at a certain time in the future, whether it would rain tomorrow, who would win or lose a battle. Turns out they were right that there's a systematic way for... Uh, scientists, in effect, to predict where planets will be. There's not such a systematic way to predict whether it will rain tomorrow, and there's not really a good scientific way to predict whether a king will win or lose a battle. So it's kind of interesting to see that in those times, it wasn't clear which of these would be, would be the relevant thing. But they studied a lot astronomical phenomena, and they had essentially an empirical theory of uh, lots of things about the motion of the moon and so on. They had pretty elaborate uh, mathematical calculations that uh, gave essentially uh, sort of uh, formulas in terms of what would we would today call a sort of a primitive version of Fourier analysis uh, that described the motion of the moon. And they, they um, uh, would keep data about that over the course of hundreds and hundreds of years. And that's how we know and some of the ancient astronomers knew things about eclipses and were able to measure uh, all sorts of features of, uh, of, uh, of the heavens based on the records that the Babylonians have kept. But the real tradition, I think, in, 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 in Babylon, uh, starting maybe 4,000 years ago, was this kind of empirical tradition of let's observe the heavens, let's fit the data, let's make what amounts to a mathematical formula for what we see, and that's what we talk about. Now, maybe they had more kind of conceptual things, but they didn't, uh, those, those were not recorded. So in a different tradition, there was kind of the, um, uh, the, the Greek tradition of, uh, of, of thinking about things, which was very much more of a philosophical tradition, very much more of a theoretical, uh, we can uh, come up with ways to understand the world just by thinking about stuff. And, you know, from early times, like uh, folks like Pythagoras, 500-ish uh, BC, um, the, uh, was thinking about sort of, can we use numbers to explore everything? And he didn't really make a distinction between numbers to understand musical harmony numbers to understand kind of the soul, 
numbers to understand the physical world. It was just like there's, there's an abstract framework with which we can think about the world. That was kind of the, the meta thing that, that he was thinking about. Well then, for particularly the pre-Socratic philosophers, 400 BC, things like that, people like Democritus and so on, uh, they were very big on, on let's just have a, a, a philosophical uh, foundation for how the world is made. And Democritus famously thought about atoms, atoma, as these indivisible units from which the world will be made. And I think the most important thing that uh, we see from some of this early philosophical thinking about the world is this idea that, yes, you know, the world can be made of lots of, for example, identical objects, and this kind of a formal theory of how the world might be made. Now, you know, there were thoughts that, you know, maybe the world is made out of lot, lots of little platonic solids. Conveniently here, there are a couple of uh, convenient platonic solids in this case made out of wood rather than out of the, the stuff the universe might be made out of. But kind of there was the idea that, you know, so one of the five platonic solids might represent uh, water, one might be fire, things like this. And that somehow there was a way to explain how the world was made in these kind of formal, essentially mathematical terms. Well, you know, I suppose the, uh, a lot of kind of the wisdom of the ancients was passed down to more modern times through the works of Aristotle. I mean, I sort of view Aristotle as the great cataloger. I mean, he would write lists of animals and plants and causes of things, structures of arguments, that's what turned into logic. Um, and he also had kind of a, a sort of a catalog of the way the physical world works and had sort of explanations based on kind of pure philosophy of, of how to think about um, the way the physical world works. So that was kind of the tradition of um, the, uh, um, uh, the, the things that um, it's like, we can figure out the world just by thinking about it. Um, I, I think that uh, one of the more interesting examples of that uh, uh, person called Lucretius, Roman uh, uh, person, maybe 60 BC, um, who, uh, wrote a book called On the Nature of Things, fairly, fairly general sounding title. But, um, uh, you know, he was trying to understand how the world works and how, how one could put together a thing like the world. And, and he had a kind of an interesting analogy, which I like very much. He said, maybe the world is put together from underlying elements like atoms in kind of the way that we might put together a sentence out of words with a certain grammatical structure. So it's kind of a way of describing a formal structure from which, through which the world can be built from sort of underlying elements. And I think kind of, you know, I think he was kind of right about the way it would work. He didn't have any of the tools. He didn't have computers. He didn't have all these kinds of things to, um, uh, to, to, to work with or to think in terms of, but that was kind of a, an interesting idea. I mean, of course, he, at the time, there were little computers. There were mechanical computers like the Antikythera device um, which, you know, was found in a shipwreck. It's this sort of a lump of things with a bunch of cogs. It's a surprisingly elaborate mechanical computer. Actually, I think Cicero mentions the existence of such a thing. Um, we don't know how common or not those were in the ancient world, but in a sense, this clockwork computer type idea did exist in ancient times. At least we have one sample of its existence. Um, so it's sort of interesting that uh, uh, what might have emerged if kind of computation had become more widespread in those times. I mean, it's, it's worth understanding that this notion of sort of the clockwork way of things working is not that different from the mathematical structure of the way the Babylonians thought about kind of the, uh, uh, their explanation of the positions of planets and the moon and things like this. Well, okay, so, so in terms of ancient times, I mean, another uh, kind of tradition of ancient, another sort of uh, thing in ancient times was the development of mathematics. And mathematics had been partly developed as sort of a practical thing in Babylon for doing uh, commerce, for, for computing financial kinds of things, for doing land surveying. That was kind of the origins of arithmetic and of geometry. Um, but it kind of reached a, uh, a different level of uh, kind of philosophical significance through the work of people like Euclid, maybe 300 BC. Uh, Euclid tried to axiomatize mathematics. He tried to say, these are just things that we can say are true that we can then build up as a purely logical matter of deduction uh, all of the things that we might know about, for example, geometry. And it was completely unclear at the time to what extent like physics might be axiomatizable uh, and to what extent the statement that Euclid makes, you know, two parallel lines never meet, to what extent that was a statement that was sort of a, uh, 
a a fact that must be true about the world that was somehow in, 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 you know associated with physics or something that was merely a mathematical assertion from which you could prove things. And it really took a long, long time before sort of this, this distinction between physics, uh, things that happen to be true about the world, and mathematics, things that are sort of deducible by pure thought, uh, could really be distinguished. And in fact, I, I would say that in very modern times, we maybe are almost back to the point where we might be able to turn physics into a branch of mathematics again. Uh, but that's for, for the future. But in any case, the, um, so, you know, this, this tradition of kind of um, uh, geometric reasoning and so on that Euclid practiced and that very much fit in with the kind of Greek tradition of let's figure out everything by pure thought. Now, there was actual physics done, like Archimedes, 250 BC, he did actual physics. He computed things using mathematics. Um, but uh, I think that he wasn't really in the, let's understand how the universe is really constructed. He was more like, well, we kind of, it's kind of obvious in some sort of Euclidean uh, geometrical axiomatic way that such and such a thing is true about uh, things in the world. Let's just compute how it works. And he was able to compute all kinds of things about volumes of solids and things like that and, and connect some of those things to physics with things like, you know, his principle of, uh, of uh, uh, displacement of volume by, you know, figuring out is this gold or not, by, um, by figuring out the density, by knowing that things displace their own volume of something like water. Okay, so the, um, uh, in, t in terms of other things that sort of happened in the ancient world, by the time one was um, uh, approaching sort of uh, zero AD. Um, there were people like Hipparchus, early astronomer, um, who made a very nice star catalog and made lots of observations and so on. By the time Ptolemy, 120 AD-ish, was around, Ptolemy kind of put together all these observations into this thing called the Almagest, which for many, many years was kind of the standard of how astronomy worked. And the Almagest, was in a sense, not really a work of physics. It was a work of kind of Euclidean style mathematics applied to observations of astronomy. And it was something where in the end he had this idea of epicycles, which were uh, essentially came from the Babylonian tradition of let's, let's make something where we can uh, work out the, the motions of planets and things in his case by lots of uh, uh, kind of um, uh, lots of spheres, um, uh, kind of um, rolling around on each other with certain particular sizes and particular detailed, elaborate structures um, that were essentially a representation of mathematical formulas. And I think that's most of what somebody like Ptolemy uh, really cared about was just the mathematical formulas that allowed you to predict things rather than the interpretation in terms of you know spheres rolling on each other, which I, I'm not sure how much uh, that was really thought about or how much anybody cared about that interpretation. I think it was much more a practical Let's see how we can make astronomical predictions. Well, okay, so, so then uh, after that, I mean, for a long, long time, the works of Hipparchus, Ptolemy, and so on, uh, most of the works of Hipparchus, I think, were lost. So it was really Ptolemy's Almagest that was kind of the standard for astronomy slash physics for, uh, well, more than a thousand years. It finally got kind of, uh, people started cleaning it up. A person called Reggio Montanus was, was big on sort of doing a big cleanup of, um, of the sort of post, uh, you know, could one make the next step in physics or astronomy after Ptolemy? And um, really, uh, you know, one of the significant next steps was Copernicus, all the way in uh, 1514, I think, um, where uh, Copernicus was kind of working in the Ptolemaic tradition in terms of epicycles, and, you know, you can understand that these sort of things roll on these things, and you can understand the motions of planets that way and so on. And you realize, well, actually, it's a lot simpler. You can, you can make a sort of technical change in the way things work, and you can make it a lot simpler if you don't imagine that uh, uh, the sun goes around the Earth. It doesn't really matter for the mathematics whether the sun goes around the Earth or the Earth goes around the sun, but you can avoid some technical details if you assume that the sun is at the center and the Earth is going around it and the other planets going around those. Um, and so he kind of introduced that as largely a technical innovation very late in his life. Um, and uh, I think what was interesting, in a sense, to me about that is that 
Yes, it was a technical innovation. Didn't even give better results. Didn't give better results than Ptolemy. Actually, I think it gave worse results than Ptolemy's way of setting things up. Um, but uh, in, in a sense, there was a, a certain, it started kind of a shock wave of a realization that uh, what you think is true, like you think the earth is stationary and stuff is moving around you, might not be true. You might be able to do something that is kind of a scientific thing and work out something which is completely not obvious to our senses. And I think that was kind of the, at a, at a meta level, the really significant feature of what Copernicus did. And in fact, there was sort of much more philosophical runoff from what Copernicus did um, than there was scientific uh, kind of development of what he did. That came rather slowly. The philosophical implications, I think, uh, were in, in many ways much bigger. They were like the, you know, science really knows what it's talking about and might, it might be different than what you can perceive with your senses, but science is going to be right and your senses are going to be wrong. And that's kind of a, a tradition that has existed pretty much to the present day and has been sort of amplified over time. Um, I think there's some problems with that tradition actually, and um, uh, which uh, we may talk about towards the end here. Well, anyway, so um, after Copernicus, um, there was, uh, well, I suppose the next, the next sort of really big the set of things that started happening were things that Galileo was doing late 1500s. Um, you know, really Galileo's, I think, uh, big initial contribution was the idea of, yeah, you can really use math to talk about physical kinds of things. So for example, the, the discovery that uh, a parabola might be relevant for the motion of a projectile. The, the realization that there are things like, things that are really mathy. I mean, things like parabolas have been, have been discovered as algebra uh, well, they, they, uh, they'd had kind of precursors in, in antiquity, but they'd really sort of come to the fore when algebra started getting developed in the 1400s and so on. Um, the, uh, I think um, the, um, uh, so, so kind of uh, the, the, the next big step was, yes, mathematics could sort of be directly entrained um, with, uh, with physics. By the way, it had already been known in antiquity that in optics, uh, kind of the, the, the theory of uh, kind of, of, of optics is very close to geometry. It's all about lines and angles and things like this. And even Euclid, for example, had actually written a book about optics, which is lost. Um, and uh, it, was, it was something considered to be sort of almost a branch of mathematics, so to speak. So there had been tradition there of sort of mathematical things applied to ideas like optics. But when it came to mechanics, um, that hadn't really been in such a tradition, and Galileo was kind of the one who really, really started pushing that. Well, then the, uh, the sort of the big, the big surprise was 1608, when um, uh, when Galileo, uh, you know, the telescope had just been invented, and Galileo sort of found out about it and improved it. Uh, there's sort of a possibly apocryphal story that Galileo had. Uh, Galileo was kind of a, a rather pugnacious fellow and and uh, quite an activist. Um, but he was also, uh, he got himself in lot, lots of kinds of trouble. But, but there's a perhaps apocryphal story that he had sold the rights to his version of the telescope to the merchants of Venice, because they really wanted to go up that, that big tower in the middle of Venice that's still there and uh, figure out, you know, whose ship, be the first person to figure out whose ship had come over the, you know, whether, whether a particular ship was, uh, was going to come home or not, um, and look out at the horizon. And having a telescope to be able to do that was really a big advantage. It kind of has, has a reminiscence of, um, uh, of modern times with uh, high frequency trading and so on, where it's, uh, you know, get a, a faster fiber optic cable to know what's happening in London if you're in New York and things like this. But back in those days, that was, you know, the Merchants of Venice with the Galileo telescope running up that, uh, that big tower in the middle of Venice and so on. But anyway, so the apocryphal story perhaps was that Galileo had sold the uh, exclusive rights to terrestrial uses of the telescope to the merchants of Venice. So he had no choice but to then try using it for something different, point the telescope to the sky, those rights were not used, um, were, not, were not sold, and, and, and in 1608, um, that's what he did. And uh, probably the most dramatic thing he discovered was the moons of Jupiter. Um, why was it dramatic to discover the moons of Jupiter? Well, because you know it had been claimed by Copernicus and so on that you know, the earth was going around the sun, things like that. This was kind of like a miniature solar system that was operating around Jupiter. And it kind of also gave the sense that some of these kind of principles of physics that we kind of had an idea 
applied in the terrestrial domain also would apply to things in the heavens and things that uh, were like, uh, you know, things orbiting Jupiter and so on. So it was sort of a big, a big realization that, um, that these kinds of uh, essentially mathematical type principles that had been, uh, that was starting to be applied to mechanics in a terrestrial domain could also apply to mechanics everywhere else. And it kind of was the, it started to speak to kind of the universality of physics across the whole universe, that it really wasn't any different what was going on in the heavens than what was going on on earth and, and so on. And that kind of started a chain of thinking that I guess we could say led to most modern mathematical science and a lot of modern technology and engineering and so on. So anyway, that was, that was the um, uh, sort of a, a big moment for, for science. Um, uh, later on, Galileo started having, um, uh, oh, I don't know, pr principles of, of describing science. An important one was what these days called Galilean invariance. The idea that um, it's really no different if you're stationary or if you're traveling at a certain speed, the laws of physics always look the same. That was important if you wanted to describe, look, you know, the earth doesn't have to be stationary. The earth can just be moving at a constant speed and it will seem like everything is the same as if it was stationary. And that's, that's why we can't tell with our senses that the earth is moving around the sun rather than the other way around. Well, okay, once the moons of Jupiter were discovered, uh, all kinds of things. For example, the fact that the speed of light was not infinite was discovered by 1670, 1680, um, by making observations on the moons of Jupiter. So it was already known that light didn't travel at infinite speed. I'm not sure that any great significance was put on that. It was known, of course, that sound didn't travel at an infinite speed. It was came clear that light traveled much faster than sound. But okay, uh, well, Meanwhile, there was, there was all sorts of question about uh, sort of the nature of light, for instance, um, like uh, Snell's law, which is the law that determines how uh, refraction works when you, when you have a light ray that goes from like air to, to, um, uh, to water, that, that law of uh, that sort of trigonometric law of, um, of the angle that the light ray will take, Snell's law was, that was uh, from 1620. Um, and then, through the 1600s, uh, there were a bunch of kind of uh, what we might say the obvious linear laws of physics that got discovered. So, for example, Boyle's law for gases, mid 1600s, um, Hooke's law for springs, that the the force on the extension of a spring is is uh, linearly proportional to how much you extend it. It was like 1660s, I think. Um, then the friction law, the law of friction, that says. Um, uh, that the, the frictional force is proportional to a constant that depends on the material times the normal force, times the amount of, of force that, that pushes the thing down onto the surface. Um, that was uh, kind of a late 1600s thing. Well, I think Leonardo da Vinci already had some ideas about how friction worked. I mean, it's kind of interesting that of those laws, um, we understand Boyle's gas law very well now. We understand Hooke's law for springs very well now. The law of friction, we actually still don't understand that well. It's still kind of mysterious exactly how and why that works and, and, and so on. So it's kind of interesting that these things that get discovered, just like when the Babylonians couldn't figure out, you know, which would be easier to predict, the motion of planets, or whether it would rain tomorrow. It's sometimes you have to have a big conceptual framework before it becomes clear what, what is easy to understand and what is not easy to understand. Well, okay, so, so uh, one thing had been discovered even in antiquity was various electrical phenomena. Um, static electricity was known. Um, uh, there was also various magnetic uh, magnetic materials were known. But kind of curiosities, um, no no great significance to them. Uh, people uh, then uh, Volta kind of uh, started understanding that, for example, the you know the muscles were somehow electrical, and then it became sort of it started to get more. There started to be more and more interest in kind of what is electricity, uh, Coulomb's law. Uh, it was late 1700s, it was discovered that um, uh, the force of attraction between charged objects uh, is, is, uh, the, is proportional to the inverse square, uh, one over the, the distance squared uh, of the, of the, between the objects. And then, um, uh, so, you know, sort of slow progress on electricity, magnetism, things like that. Um, I guess by this point, let's see, we're hitting about um, uh, the 1800s. So what happened then? Well, let's see, there, there was some, um, 
Uh, so beginning of the 1800s, people, uh, like Thomas Young had his wave theory for light. And then as soon as that came in, people were able to start doing all kinds of calculations. I mean, it had been very unclear what light was. Um, people knew about, uh, um, about interference of light. Um, the, the, uh, for example, um, Newton's rings, you know, when you see an, a, a layer of oil, you'll see these uh, kind of light and dark rings and so on that uh, are associated with the, the, uh, the, we now know are associated with the thickness of the oil and uh, how many wavelengths of light it corresponds to, things like that. Um, but anyway, there were, there were kind of phenomena like that that had been seen. And there were also phenomena that made it look like light was just a bunch of corpuscles, a bunch of particles that would just go in straight lines, kind of like a big, big stream of these things. And so, I mean, that we now know that there's sort of a duality between this light as photons and light as waves thing, but that didn't come until the until the 1900s. Um, but back in 1800, around 1801, I think um, uh, Thomas Young was talking about you know the wave theory of light. Um, and uh, that became a sort of more formal thing. And within a decade or so, people were able to do all kinds of elaborate calculations of diffraction and light and uh, interference and so on. It became kind of a thing that had been mathematicized. I mean, it's, it's worth mentioning that um, uh, in, um, uh, in uh, oh yeah, we, we forgot an absolutely critical piece of, of history, which I, I, I'm, I'm shocked that I forgot because it's one of my kind of favorites and I'm, I'm just, um, uh, I'm, I, I, was, I was talking about uh, kind of things in the 1600s and these kind of empirical laws of, um, uh, of, um, uh, of, of how things work before we get to the 1700s, before we get to um, electricity, before we get to light and so on, we have to talk about Newton and we have to talk about um, uh, the, the, the things that Newton did. Actually, the main things, um, uh, uh, his big year was 1665, which happened to be the year that Cambridge University was closed because of the plague. And Newton went and, and hung out at his uh, sort of ancestral home um, in uh, Lincolnshire, I think, um, and, uh, uh, and was thinking about stuff and came up with two pretty good ideas. One was his law of gravity and the other was calculus. Um, he didn't publish those things until 1687, his big book, uh, Principia Mathematica. I mean, it's the, the sort of the title of the book already tells you kind of something of the philosophical implications. Uh, the title of the book, the full title is uh, translated into English, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. So sort of pre-Newton, the, the, the general thinking about how one thought about nature was as kind of a branch of philosophy, as a natural philosophy. The, 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 the basic thinking had been uh, one just figures out how nature works by pure thought, just like how Aristotle had done it, just like how Democritus had done it, and so on. And But what Newton was saying was, no, actually, there are mathematical principles of natural philosophy. Now, Galileo had had some precursors to this, but Newton was kind of the full-fledged, you can figure out how the world works using mathematical principles. And so he developed some mathematical principles, particularly his laws of motion, first, second, and third law, um, for example, the, um, uh, you know, the first law, an object remains an, an object that isn't acted on by a force, just remains in, in motion in the same way it's been moving before. Um, at the second law, um, it's, uh, you know, force is mass times acceleration and so on. Now, you know, you might say in modern times, the first law is obvious. We know if you set something in motion, it'll, and you don't act on it by a force, you know, it's a, it's a, um, uh, something on a, uh, on an air table, on a, you know, a puck on, a, on an ice rink, something like this. You set it in motion, it'll just keep going unless it's acted on by a force. That seems really obvious to us today. It's a lot less obvious if you don't have things where friction has been reduced to almost zero. If you are dealing with kind of, well, we just, uh, you know, you're pushing something through mud or you're just rolling something on the ground, it's far from obvious that it will keep going uh, and, and with, if, an, if a force isn't acting on it, because actually, the force is usually acting on it, it's the force of friction. Um, and so this was a, the idea that there was this sort of perfect version of this where the thing will just keep going um, without, uh, if, if no force acts on it, wasn't self-evidently obvious. It was, a, it was really a mathematical idealization that was significant and that was Newton's first law. Well, Newton then, uh, with his forces, mass times acceleration and so on, um, that immediately 
started asking, well, can you actually compute, given that you know that force is equal to mass times acceleration, what are the forces that act on things? So one very important force that Newton thought about when he was thinking about astronomy was the force of gravity. Um, and then he had to work out, well, what is the force that gravity exerts? And that's when he came up with his inverse square law of gravity, um, this, his universal law of gravity, that between any two objects, the force of gravity is the mass of one object times the mass of the other object divided by the square of the distance between them or multiplied by some universal constant, we now called capital G. The, um, so that was his kind of idea. And his idea was that was going to be the law of gravity that applied to everything, whether it was the moons of Jupiter, whether it was the sun around the Earth, whether it was a comet in the solar system, all these things, the law of gravity would apply. And um, the, uh, uh, you know, I've realized I, I've, uh, I forgot another important um, piece of this story, um, which was, uh, uh, let, let me, I'm, I'm sorry to backtrack here, but I just want to fill in one more, one more piece. Um, which was uh, around the time that Galileo was, was observing the moons of Jupiter, um, the, uh, uh, another, um, another important, a little bit before that actually, another important development was, was Kepler. Um, Kepler was uh, uh, actually a very capable mathematician um, who had a completely wacky theory of the solar system that was kind of a, uh, an evolved version of the sort of uh, uh, Copernican meets Ptolemaic idea and his idea actually was to use the platonic solids as a representation of the, of the motions of planets um, and to have these sort of uh, concentric, um, uh, um, concentric platonic solids, which uh, happened by the mathematics, the mathematical results on the, uh, on the distances of, of uh, platonic solids. If you, if you were to nest all the platonic solids inside each other, it so happens that the results you would get for the ratios of their sizes agreed rather well with the known planets which went out to Saturn at the time um, in, uh, in the solar system. So, uh, so Kepler was like, we've derived this from mathematics. We've got from mathematics, we have derived uh, what, um, how the solar system works. When the moons of Jupiter were discovered, he had to start having rhombic uh, polyhedra as the way to describe those, and it all got kind of, kind of wacky. But, but Kepler was, even though his underlying theory was complete nonsense, the um, the mathematics that he did was perfectly good, and the mathematics he did both on polyhedra and, more importantly, the mathematics he did in realizing that the orbits of planets could be represented as ellipses and coming up with Kepler's laws, uh, which were essentially empirical laws for the motion of planets derived from the mathematics of ellipses. I had sort of forgotten to mention that, I'm sorry. Um, that was something that, uh, that Newton um, was, then, uh, was then able to leverage because what Newton did was to say, okay, given this universal law of gravity, and these laws of motion, then it's just a matter of mathematics to derive Kepler's result that the motion of planets should be ellipses. And uh, the, the just a matter of mathematics required some mathematical sophistication, and that mathematical sophistication was, the, was the, what originated calculus, what caused Newton to invent, invent calculus, was the attempt to work out, given that force is equal to mass times acceleration, acceleration is, uh, the rate of change of the rate of change of position, how do you work out what the position is given that, okay, you use calculus to do that. And so he had to invent the way to do that. So that was 1687. And, and kind of what emerged from what Newton did was um, uh, you could then just use Newton's law of gravitation, Newton's laws of motion and calculus to compute all kinds of things. One thing that was interesting was that you could compute stuff, but it wasn't easy. And that was kind of a new thing because it had tended to be the case that the things that one could actually compute uh, from sort of first principles in a sense were kind of easy to compute. I mean, although the Babylonians and the uh, and Ptolemy and so on had, had pretty elaborate empirical formulas, the things where it looked, it felt like you were starting from first principles had always been easy to compute. Actually, it's sort of an interesting thing when Newton was trying to compute the position of the, the, the motion of the moon uh, it's kind of a kind of a good example and a, and a lesson for, for those of us who do theoretical science. Um, Newton had got all of his whole universal law of gravitation and this and that, and then he tried to compute the motion of the moon. Uh, and uh, he has this long chapter of his Principia where he computes it, and the last sentence says, but the apse of the moon is twice as great. In other words, Newton got the wrong answer by a factor of two. So 
you know, one might be taught in sort of the Baconian tradition of, of experimental science, if the experiment disagrees with your theory, abandon the theory. But one thing that I've learned in, in my efforts of doing science, when the, when the theory is strong enough, when the theory has enough things going for it and has enough of a sort of aesthetic integrity to it, keep going with the theory. Sometimes the experiments will turn out to be wrong, or sometimes there's something wrong with the chain of deduction from the theory to the prediction for the experiments. In the case of Newton, the problem was with the chain of deduction, computing the three-body problem, the problem of the Earth, Moon, and Sun, all having gravitational attraction to each other. That's a very difficult mathematical problem. Uh, in fact, we now know that it isn't soluble in some sense in terms of sort of algebraic functions and things like this. Um, it's, a, it's a problem in which, uh, in which uh, chaotic phenomena happen. It's a, it's a very elaborate problem. In fact, it's a problem where I think that it will turn out you can make any computation. You can have a three-body system that does any computation you want. In other words, a three-body system is as sophisticated as any computation. So, the, uh, uh, but anyway, Newton uh, was able to work out, sort of almost work out the motion of the moon. Other people later on steadily tightened that up by around 1900, when had really pretty good calculations of the motion of the moon. Um, one gets to test those every time there's a total eclipse. It's a rather sensitive prediction of exactly where the moon is. Um, like in the most recent total solar eclipse that was visible from the US a couple of years ago, uh, we were able to use sort of modern techniques to uh, predict to the second um, when the, uh, when the uh, path of totality would, uh, uh, would hit in any particular point um, in, in, on its path. And I was a little bit concerned whether it would actually be correct because it involved all kinds of elaborate things, including relativistic corrections and all that kind of stuff. So we were we had a, a website which uh, lots of people used to to work out um, when the eclipse would arrive. I was a little worried whether it would actually work correctly. We had a, a person uh, who worked at our company who happened to be on the the very uh, western extremity of the of the U.S. where the where the eclipse was sort of first touched. And so it was, it was good to verify that, yes, at least when the eclipse first arrived, it was indeed correct. But in any case, um, you know, back, back to Newton, one of the things sort of interesting there, um, Newton realized this thing about uh, the fact that, you know, you can have a calculation that is uh, where you can specify the rules for the calculation, but it may be really hard to actually calculate what happens. So he has a nice passage where he talks about, um, uh, where he's very concerned about the, the motion of the planets and things, and he says, we don't know how the planets kind of originated in their motion, and, and that's kind of the hand of God to put them where they start. But once they have started, then we can, in principle, calculate where they will where they will end up. But he says, but to know for many planets with all of their mutual effects on each other, um, where they'll end up exceeds, if I'm not mistaken, he said, the force of any human mind. So in other words, he was, he was recognizing the fact that there was a computational difficulty um, in in working out the consequences of the theory that he developed. Well, in practice, uh, lots of people um, uh, worked on it, and through the course of the 1700s into the 1800s, there was more and more sophistication in the use of essentially calculus to do mechanical calculations. I think it in, in, uh, was used both in terms of uh, uh, astronomical calculations, celestial mechanics, and also terrestrial calculations, I think, for some reason, particularly British tradition, was uh, uh, studying the motion of tops and these bizarre, these, the pole hode and the hurple hode and all these, all these weird phenomena about um, how tops move that were sort of a, became, I, I think, a particularly British mathematical physics tradition and obsession. But uh, in any case, there was an increasing level of sophistication of what could be worked out using calculus and using essentially Newtonian uh, mechanics ideas. Um, and that was kind of the big development of the 1700s to to the early 1800s. And, and I might say that, that um, uh, you know, at the time of Newton, if you'd asked somebody, what is the world fundamentally made of? Probably the answer that you would have got is it's made of corpuscles. I don't really know what those are, but those are a little bit maybe like Democritus's atoms. We don't really know what they are. Um, that are somehow bound together by forces and post-Newton, it was like, well, maybe they're bound together by gravitational forces. But that was kind of the the meta idea for what the world might be made of, although it wasn't something that was really studied in great and tremendous detail. Um, when electrical stuff started uh, becoming sort of a big thing in the 1800s, um, I think people were more tended to say that there were electrical forces that were, were holding things together. But sort of the, 
the, the thing of the 1800s, uh, in addition to sort of very elaborate development of, uh, of theories that were spin-offs of, of Newton's uh, mechanics and calculus. I mean, the, the main spin-offs that developed were solid mechanics and fluid mechanics, the theory of stresses and solids, and the theory of the flow of fluids. Um, stresses and solids turns out to be a much easier problem than the flow of fluids. The flow of fluids has this very complicated issue of fluid turbulence. When a fluid flows rapidly, a fluid is flowing slowly, just sort of slides around objects, and it does it in a, a laminar, smooth, layered way. Um, but when it moves quickly, you get this kind of random turbulence that develops. And to find a theory of turbulence is still something that hasn't been done. I've tried to make some contributions to that myself, and I think I understand now uh, sort of the, the, the immediate answer to the question, why is there randomness and turbulence? I think we can now answer that question. But um, in, the, in the 1800s, as the theory of, of fluids was developing, um, turbulence was sort of off the table. It was just working out the, the partial differential equations, things like the Navier-Stokes equations that described sort of the, uh, uh, the parts of fluid flow that you could work out using by solving uh, differential equations using calculus and so on. So anyway, those were, those were two big traditions of that time. The, the, other, the other big thing that was happening was electricity and magnetism. Um, I think the, um, uh, there were both observations and theories. The, uh, I think the, the um, uh, Faraday, Michael Faraday, 1830, uh, discovered electromagnetic induction, the fact that uh, when you wave a magnet around, you, you uh, produce a voltage in a wire, you can induce a current in a wire. Um, very critical thing for electrical machinery but that was discovered by, by Faraday purely experimentally. Um, then gradually, uh, it was sort of the, the idea of the notion of an electric field or a magnetic field, a sort of a thing that was out there that had an effect. So for example, Faraday was, you know, used to have make these, do these demonstrations and so on, where you have iron filings, little tiny bits of iron sprinkled around and you put a magnet there and you'll see this actual pattern of the iron filings that is sort of, produced by this thing you can't see that is the what he termed the magnetic field. Uh, Faraday wasn't that mathematically oriented, but it sort of quickly became clear that that notion of a field was all connected with partial differential equations. And uh, then the sort of the, the big thing that happened um, uh, by the 1870s was, was James Clerk Maxwell coming up with his Maxwell's equations, which were these sort of unified equations that described electric and magnetic fields. Um, and it was, uh, it was very, um, uh, I remember exactly when this was, yeah. So, so it, was, it was actually uh, within a decade after Maxwell's equations, one of, one of the implications of Maxwell's equations, and one of the things that was sort of realized through the experiments that Faraday had done was that electricity and magnetism were very closely connected, that you could... Uh, use magnets to make electricity. You could use electricity to make magnetism, and so on. And those that kind of that that unification really came together in Maxwell's equations, which are four equations, partial differential equations, that describe the uh, um, the, uh, the 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 mechanics of electric and magnetic fields. They tell you how charges and currents, electric charges, electric currents, make electric and magnetic fields, and they tell you how electric and magnetic fields fit together. And you know Maxwell was a good mathematician and um, uh, invented vector analysis and things like all those div grad curl all those things that's all Maxwell's. Although he, he originally wanted to call curl twirl, which might have been charming for the calculus students of, of the future. Um, but uh, anyway, he settled on on, on curl eventually. Um, but uh, the um, uh, but, but anyway, so Maxwell's equations uh, have made these statements about how electromagnetic fields would work. One of the implications of those was that there will be, it will be possible to produce waves, electromagnetic waves. And within a decade, uh, Hertz had observed uh, electromagnetic waves and had figured out and had basically created the first radio. And it didn't take very long. It took um, uh, less than a decade before there was actual real radio being used and people were transmitting uh, messages that had been given done on wires with telegrams and so on. They were using, you know, in Morse code, they were sending messages purely through electromagnetic waves. So that was kind of the, the realization that, um, uh, that, that came out of the mathematics that Maxwell had done uh, 
that um, there should be electromagnetic waves, and by golly, there actually were electromagnetic waves, and they made radio. So, so that was kind of the um, uh, big development of, um, of the late 1800s, was this idea of electromagnetism, electromagnetic fields, things like radio, uh, and those, those sorts of things. So um, uh, the, um, uh, another, so another thing that was happening um, in, um, yeah, I should have, somebody on live stream is, is commenting on um, discovery of the vacuum. So that was in around the time of the French Revolution, right? So uh, that was, um, so that was in the, the 1700s. The, the realization that the air that is not, uh, the, 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 there's a notion of there being nothing there, so to speak, that you could make things where there isn't any air and where there's something where there's nothing there. I'm not sure, I think for chemistry, that was an important realization. I'm not sure that that was well ingested by the physicists. Um, uh, and in fact, there were a bunch of issues about what, you know, what the role, the notion of whether a vacuum really, really had nothing there. So one of the important ones of those was um, uh, people knew about sound and they knew that sound was uh, compression waves in, in the air. And you could also have sound in solids. It was compression waves in solids and things like that. And, and people like Helmholtz, I think 1860s-ish, um, had developed a pretty complete theory, mathematical theory of sound that, um, uh, and um, uh, Rayleigh, I think, had a, had, a, had a version of this. In fact, his, his book, as I, uh, Helmholtz and Rayleigh's books on sound, I certainly have copies of them. And I think they're pretty modern, actually. Um, there's not a lot, uh, you know, can say more with more, more, more techniques, but they pretty much had nailed the way sound works and the mathematics of sound waves and so on. Um, but, you know, there was a question, uh, come to a little bit more later, but, but there was a question for electromagnetic waves. We know that sound waves are compression and rarefaction waves in air, in a material. The question is, what are electromagnetic waves, waves in? And so this notion developed of this thing called the ether, the so-called in a very Victorian sounding name, the luminiferous ether, the light carrying ether. Um, that was the, uh, uh, the idea was that um, there was this, this unseen, unseen thing that was the analog of what air was to sound, the luminiferous ether was to electromagnetic waves. And that was kind of at the time of Maxwell and people like that, that was kind of the way people thought things worked. So um, the, uh, uh, well, another, another important development in the 1800s, the 1800s were, you know, there's a, physics really started galloping along. After Galileo and Newton, you know, physics kind of got in gear and things really started to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different kinds of phenomena in the world. Another important area is heat, the, the theory of heat, the idea of temperature, the theory of heat, those kinds of things. There's a big debate in the 1800s. What is heat? Um, and uh, so it got a little bit weird and funky. I mean, it was, it was already suspected in the, 18, in the 1600s that heat was somehow associated with the microscopic motion of, of the things that made up matter. And even, for example, one of the Bernoullis um, had figured out uh, that, you know, gases might be little molecules all bouncing around. That was in the, the mid-1700s. Um, but that nobody really particularly cared about that. I mean, people were very much um, uh, concerned about heat. And, and then when steam engines were invented, it was important to understand kind of what was possible in steam engines. Uh, Sadiq Carnot worked out um, uh, the, the notion of an idealized steam engine and tried to work out how much, how much energy you could get from an idealized steam engine, these kinds of things. But this notion of what is heat, what is the thing that corresponds to heat, wasn't clear. And it got kind of weird and a little bit like the ether. There was this notion of things like phlogiston, this, this substance that would suffuse things and that corresponded to heat. Um, and um, this... This idea that it was a um, uh, that there was that heat wasn't a substance um, that was a property. It was just a property of things, not its own separate uh, sort of uh, you know separated kind of substance. Um, that was that took until the mid 1800s before that started to become clear. And there started to be experiments. People like Joule, um, uh, who did uh, did experiments sort of about the interconvertibility of heat 
as and and other forms of an, an energy and things that were known from mechanics, things about the the energy of motion that was understood from mechanics. And and by the way, following Newton and so on, the idea of the conservation momentum, the conservation of mechanical energy, these were things that had emerged from mechanics. Um, but uh, it wasn't clear sort of how heat fitted into that. Well, then 1850-ish, sort of big, uh, big point, the first law of thermodynamics, the idea that heat is a form of energy and that the energy and mechanical work, uh, energy of mechanical work like kinetic energy is sort of interchangeable with the energy of heat. And so that was, that was kind of a thing of around 18, 1850. Um, people like Clausius, I think, was involved in that. Um, the, uh, this, this notion of uh, heat as a form of energy, interconvertible with mechanical energy. Well, the only thing was that it was clear that it wasn't completely interconvertible because if you had something that was hot, you couldn't immediately turn that thing that was hot, you know, into useful mechanical work. And so it was kind of like, why is that? You know, what was, what's going on there? And that's what became the second law of thermodynamics. Um, what we now often refer to as the law of entropy increase. But back in those days, it was kind of this, this law that said, you can't get mechanical work out of heat energy that easily. Um, and so, for example, a, a common version of it would be the statement that heat doesn't spontaneously flow from a uh, colder body to a hotter body. Um, that was one, one version of the second law of thermodynamics. But it became slowly clearer what... Um, uh, what the second law might be, um, and, uh, uh, and this notion that, I mean, we now know that the issue is uh, mechanical work involves, you know, you take this big lump of stuff and you start it in motion. And that means all the atoms in that big lump of stuff are all going in one particular direction. If you just make the lump of stuff hot, it means the atoms are moving around. They're moving around very quickly, but they're moving around in random ways. And we can't kind of decode that randomness so that we can kind of organize it into uh, this sort of systematic mechanical motion. And that, that failure to be able to uh, organize it is, I think, the origin of the second law, but we'll come to that. Um, but anyway, back in those days, this notion of, um, uh, of the second law sort of emerged um, 1860s-ish, uh, kind of it was starting to be really talked about, Two big things happened. So James Clerk Maxwell, actually before he'd worked on electromagnetism, uh, worked on kinetic theory. He was um, he worked on a um, a prize essay about the moons of Saturn, um, and in it he invented what is now called kinetic theory. He invented kind of the mathematical theory that describes you have a bunch of gas molecules bouncing around. What can you say about the properties of those molecules? So one big thing he said was the distribution of velocities of those uh, molecules is this Gaussian-like distribution e to the minus uh, mv squared um, uh, distribution um, that is now called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So that was a, a sort of a mathematics meets the kind of the, uh, the mathematics meets the idea that gases are really a bunch of little, little particle-like things bouncing around. Uh, that was a, a Maxwell idea. Then along came um, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann um, and uh, by 1870 he had um, uh, proved this thing called the H theorem. So, okay, so there'd been this idea in trying to characterize what heat was relative to other forms of energy. There'd been this idea, I think due to Clausius, um, that uh, you could define a notion of what's called entropy, which he defined as a thing that was essentially heat divided by temperature. Okay, so what, what uh, Boltzmann proved was on the basis of uh, little gas molecules bouncing around, he proved this thing called the H theorem that he said meant that he proved that the entropy as defined by Clausius always increases. And that's equivalent to statements like heat doesn't spontaneously flow from a colder body to a hotter body. It's equivalent to a lot of other kinds of statements. Um, and so Boltzmann said he proved that. Now, his proof was kind of a bit of a sham. It's an interesting mathematical proof, but because uh, it turns out the laws of physics are reversible, at least in this sense, um, in the sense that they, uh, whatever, whatever, uh, the laws of mechanics have the property that if you can have two things that collide like this and go out like that, you could sort of run the movie in reverse and they could come in from where they start, from where they ended up and uh, go back and get back to where you started from. Um, and so that reversibility was kind of 
Boltzmann had gone from taking that uh, 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 mechanics that was reversible just like that and had proved that something irreversible happened. It was the so-called reversibility objection. And um, that was a very obscure thing. In fact, it's one of my sort of favorite uh, physics misguidedness um, uh, things is that in textbooks, modern textbooks, they'll often talk about the second law of thermodynamics. They'll show Boltzmann's proof of the H theorem. They'll say, well, yes, you can run everything backwards. And uh, how can it not? Uh, how can you then conclude that entropy increases rather than decreases? They'll often end with statements like the last sentence being, this point is often puzzling to the student. Um, well, actually, it's been puzzling to everybody else, too. I think I finally figured out in the 1990s, actually, how this works. And um, it really, the story is, uh, well, uh, it's, it's the, the story is that what's happening is the everything is reversible, but the dynamics of the system is effectively doing encryption on the initial conditions of the system. So while in principle you could reverse it, you need to be a cryptanalyst to do it, so to speak. And in practice, when we do experiments or make observations, we're not as computationally sophisticated as we would need to be to do that reversal. So even though looked at at a microscopic level, everything is perfectly reversible, it doesn't appear that way to an actual observer. That, that was a kind of an idea that uh, um, uh, Josiah Willard Gibbs, one of the early American physicists um, from the early 1900s, um, he was big on this notion of coarse graining in statistical mechanics, which was kind of his version of saying the observer can't, um, uh, can't, um, can't figure out at the level sort of molecule by molecule what's going on. He didn't really have this computation idea, but he just had the idea of you can't look at the individual molecules and see what's happening. I mean, Maxwell already had this thing called Maxwell's demon, where you've had a thought experiment where he said, imagine there are these two, uh, two sides of a box and there's a trap door in between them. And there's this little very tiny creature who is watching when molecules arrive at that trap door and is deciding whether to send them to the left or to the right. And with that demon, you can always get a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. By having sort of intelligence like that in the loop, um, you can get this violation of the second law. And that's kind of like saying, that's a kind of uh, a, the beginnings of saying you sort of need a cryptanalyst to figure out what to, how to untangle the inexorable increase of entropy associated with the second law. Actually, I should mention that one feature of the second law was that uh, particularly late 1800s, it was, um, uh, it was kind of, there was this whole question of was there a life force? Was there something about living systems, about biology, that was fundamentally different from physical systems? And it's, it's been a long-standing question of, you know, is there some spark of life that is going beyond the physics, the chemistry, and so on? And that was, um, uh, that was what, um, so this, the second law was often kind of invoked in a, well, most things show the law of entropy increase, but living systems can sort of do the opposite. Well, they can't really. They can only do it temporarily, and they can only do it in a sort of a Maxwell's demonish kind of way at the level of individual molecules, but it doesn't really last. But in any case, that didn't become clear until well into the 1900s. And, and what really happened is this, this notion of what were the foundations of the second law, which I think is a fascinating thing. It's one of the things that got me interested in physics uh, back when I was about 12 years old or something in 1972, um, was understanding things about the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and it's sort of, uh, sort of shocking that that so little work has been done on it. And when I finally figured out how I think it actually works, I don't think anybody cares. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's really interesting. Okay, back to, um, uh, I, I should mention, you know, uh, by the way, I mean, by the time after this whole life force thing sort of dissipated, by probably the 1930s, people had the point of view that uh, the second law was just true. It was a fundamental true fact about nature. We sort of maybe kind of didn't maybe even need to prove it, maybe, or maybe Boltzmann had proved it, or people were kind of confused about it. I mean, the, the idea of entropy got kind of a boost in the 1940s when Claude Shannon uh, introduced the idea of information um, as, a, as a measure of uh, sort of the compressibility of data, um, because basically his information measure is exactly minus the um, uh, uh, Boltzmann's um, entropy measure. Okay, so another big thing from the 1600s, um, uh, from the, from, sorry, from the 1800s um, was, uh, um, um, uh, was um, um, uh, the, the whole notion of atoms really becoming real. 
And, um, you know, it had been known, chemistry had developed a lot. Lots of chemical elements were known by the 1860s. Mendeleev was sort of writing his chemistry textbook and making up the periodic table, all those kinds of things. People, this, this notion that there was a systematization of chemistry was becoming clear. Meanwhile, people like Dalton, even the beginning of the 1800s, had uh, noticed things about chemical reactions. They analog in um wolfram's awesome i'll try and continue this tomorrow this was just a test it worked out well i think mm -hmm.